Hello and welcome to another part of our special focus on green investment, green finance and the green initiative for India. We've been traversing various facets of this conversation and today we're talking about perhaps one of the most important legs of it, which is bilateral cooperation in order to build a better structure, both in terms of climate change as also better policies. COVID has been a bit of a left turn for most countries and it's probably taken the focus off climate change specifically but interestingly, it's probably also raised uh, the importance of having responsible policy decisions around ecology and around our environment. As I said, the most important uh, pinwheel within this is what happens with bilateral dialogue. India has had partnership and cooperation with nations like the US and UK, whether it's on technology or finance or R&D. But what more can be done and what more can be done as we circle around to what could be one of the biggest events around uh, environmental policy, which is COP26, that now happens next year. Joining me are two people who are experts in that field and will be weighing in both from the US and UK perspective. Thank you both for joining in. Let me quickly introduce you, Ambassador Richard Burma, who's previously US Ambassador to India. He's currently Vice Chair and Partner at the Asia Group. And Natalie Toms, who's Minister Counselor for Economics and Energy at the British High Commission. In her own words, she's very, very passionate about climate change and indeed the COP26. Thank you both for joining in. Ambassador Varma, first word with you. Um, there is a fear that perhaps because of what's gone down in 2020, some of the momentum has been lost in terms of climate change and you know building policy in that direction. A, do you agree that seems to be the general thread globally? And B, how important do you think bilateral cooperation becomes in that context? Yeah, first, thank you very much. Thank you for including me. It's great to be with all of you. Uh, and Natalie, it's great to be with you as well. And Appreciate everything the British High Commission has done. Uh, what a what a close partner to both countries. Uh, let me just say, I think you know, as we're in this pandemic, and and the U.S. and India are still very much in the middle of of fighting the pandemic, we realize a, a couple things. One, this abstract notion of of transnational threats becomes very real, and it hit our shores very hard, and it hit. India very hard uh, as well. And we, when we think of other transnational threats, threats that impact us, uh, climate change and the impacts from climate change are very much part of that basket of things we need to be worried about. So I hope that, yes, we have to deal with the current crisis before us, but we have to look at what's coming down the road and is really in front of us right now, and, and that is the threat of a warming uh, planet and the consequences that come with it. That's the first point I'd make. The second thing I think we should realize is that this crisis has showed us that we can't solve these problems by ourselves. This, act this takes global action, global coordination, institutional structures, and that is exactly what we need to solve the problems of, of climate change. And so to answer your question directly, when I think about, you know, two of the top four emitters, uh, you know, globally, the United States and India, two of uh, the largest democracies on the planet, you know, we have a certain set of responsibilities. Now, um, the U.S. probably has a much greater share of the responsibility given our per capita uh, emissions that we that we have in this country, but again, the potential of what the US and India can do together is really, really substantial. And I'm really proud of what we were able to do at Paris, for example, between the US and India. And I'll just say this, I've said it many times before, if you were to ask President Obama, he would say there would be no Paris climate agreement, but for the leadership of India. And I hope one of the first things a new U.S. president would do is get back into the Paris Climate Agreement and uh, kind of revitalize this area of cooperation between the U.S. and India. I think you've set up my question very well for Natalie, Ambassador Varma, because it so is about leadership. Natalie, the COP26 UN summit now happens in 2021. It's a bit of a glass half full or half empty situation where some believe 
that perhaps this is the time to really build momentum and come out with something very strong and tight in terms of policies. Whereas there is the other side which says that having rolled this over to next year, perhaps political will might sag getting into that event and it may not get the impetus that it needs. Um, you know, which side are you on? Well, first of all, um, thank you very much, uh, Mitali. Thank you to ORF and Ambassador Verma. It's, it's great to be here too. Um, and, and I think in answer to your question, I, I don't think that momentum has necessarily been lost um, due to the COVID crisis. I, I, think, I think clearly the climate crisis isn't waiting for the COVID crisis. Um, we're, we're seeing that every day. We're seeing that in the, you know, the, 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 the monsoon flooding this, this, this year. Um, but I think at the same time, the crisis has shown us, I think as Ambassador Verma uh, suggested what what happens when um, uh, you know humanity's relationship with nature breaks down what happens um, when these risks are are realized and it's shown us the need i think to build back from this crisis and what well, not only build back from this crisis but to build back better um, with a clean and a resilient um, recovery um, I, I think it's also important to say that i think the economics have changed since the last global financial crisis um, meaning that now, uh, today, a clean and resilient recovery makes economic sense. And I think it makes sense not only kind of in, in the medium term, but it makes sense kind of right now. I mean, low carbon technology is, is, is now often cheaper or very soon to be cheaper um, than other technologies. I think two thirds of the world's population live in countries where renewables are the cheapest source of new power generation, and that includes here in India. And we're seeing the cost of electric vehicles fall rapidly and we're starting to see the market price this in um, as, as, as well. And I think India has continued to show impressive leadership and commitment on climate even through this crisis. Uh, so I think in June we saw the, the uh, solar auction which set the record low tariff and we've seen the launch of the real-time power market, the, the Prime Minister Modi uh, uh, launching the the real renewables energy plant, a massive um, renewables plant. And then we've seen things like the Indian railways committing to become a net zero emitter by 2030, but also lots of action by Indian corporates, including, uh, including the, the Reliance Group, for example, committing to net zero by 2035. So I think there's lots of uh, really exciting things happening. And similarly in the UK, our own economic recovery package included three billion pounds of green investment. Um, all, all focused on uh, delivering our commitment to meet net zero emissions by 2050. Um, of course, there's always space for us to go further and faster, and um, uh, that's what we'll be looking to do at, uh, at COP26. Um, but I think, uh, and, and I think UK-India bilateral cooperation will be really important um, to that. But again, that's cooperation which is ongoing and is, which has been happening even during this crisis. Um, for example, we. We've co-chaired the first meetings of um, Prime Minister Modi's uh, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Our joint Green Growth Equity Fund has, has received and made additional investments. And we were working together on, on that um, real-time power market. So um, I think, you know, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not great that COP26 has had to be postponed. Um, but I don't think that means that we've lost momentum on the on the on the action. Uh, one is the health crisis, of course. Within that, or next to that, is the environmental crisis, and then there's the economics of it, as Natalie pointed out. Within economics, also, it's time it, it seems to rethink the entire manufacturing setup where countries like India and the US are not only big markets, but India could potentially be an alternate destination as well. Is this the best time, you think, to start thinking about sustainable manufacturing anew? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, as Natalie said, I think India has really set the kind of lead in this category. When I look at the renewable targets that India has set, uh, amazing. You know, we went from 175, I think, gigawatts in 2022 to now uh, 220, and then now up to 400 plus by uh, 2030. This is, in, this is really an incredible leadership. And it's not just, man, it, it can't just be in one sector. It can't just be in manufacturing. It's gotta be across the board. And again, I, I think we see that in front of us. So the question I think is what can governments actually do? You know, the amount of investment required is massive, somewhere on the order of $500 billion in order to achieve these goals. You know, no single government is gonna take $500 billion or have access to $500 billion. But the two governments can create the conditions 
that bring in the investment and community uh, to invest in the renewable uh, uh, sector, in every element of the sector. And we're seeing that happen. And so that's where I think the, the Washington, London, Delhi, uh, Brussels, uh, take your pick. We, we need to work together to actually to create the conditions, set the policy, and, and allow the private sector and public sector to come together. You know, the, the real innovation and real technology enhancements are happening in the private sector. They need to bring them to bear. And, and hopefully India will create those conditions. There are still some issues about regula regulatory certainty, legal certainty. We've seen some contracts, uh, you know, vitiated and to be renegotiated. So we, we have to create the confidence. We can do that. And then on our side, you know, I'd like to see us go further. I'd love to see the United States in the International Solar Alliance. I'd love to see us, as we wrote in our joint ORF report with the Asia Group, I'd love to see a new climate dialogue so that we can actually start generating the policy uh, parameters that get the investment required and start to address the really critical, urgent needs that are needs of a, of a country, of a society, of a, of a people, but, but will all benefit if India meets these great targets. Mm -hmm. There's another important learning though from the US itself, Ambassador Varma, which is that, uh, you know, bereft of federal leadership, there have been examples led by community and cities and states where they've gone out and really made a change. Um, do you think there are important lessons within that for India and frankly any other country that may be watching? Sure. No, I look, I, I've been really impressed by what the states and cities in the, in the United States have done. I think some 26 states have said that they are not only going to commit to the Paris targets, they are going to try to exceed them. California has been a leader, but some states you wouldn't uh, even suspect in the in the mid and mountain west have said they are completely committed uh, to these targets, not just for environmental sake, not just for the good that comes with it, but also there's look the economic future, the job creation future is in the renewable sector. When we look at the the coal uh, and carbon based jobs, those jobs are decreasing and they're decreasing at a fairly substantial level. And we need to support the workers that are being displaced, but it is, it is the natural evolution. The jobs that are increasing at a remarkable rate are in the renewable sector, in solar, in wind, in um, biomass, small hydro, et cetera. And so look, states and cities and companies understand this. And this is, this is, I think this is a great development. It is a natural development. And so, yeah, we can learn a lot from the kind of what's happened at the state and, and local level, but I will just close with this. I think what COVID has shown us is that if you let 50 American states and 1,000 American cities and 10,000 American counties have their own response and have their own set of policies, that's also very difficult too. So strong federal leadership is certainly required We've seen that in India, and I'm hoping Washington can get back to that as well. Natalie, coming on that, because everything now um, is viewed with a pre-COVID and post-COVID lens. As we step into the COP26 UN Summit next year, do you think there are important learnings specifically from COVID for India and the UK to take forward in that conversation? Well, that's an interesting question. I, ha I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that one before. I think what, what's, what is for sure is that I think five or now six years after the Paris Agreement, um, COP26 is going to be a, a landmark um, yeah. moment. And we, we want it to be one in which the world, including national, state, city governments, business and civil society, are all, all unite for this clean and resilient recovery, which delivers for the people, it delivers for the planet. Um, and we're obviously going to champion the, um, the Paris ag Agreement, um, of, of which the UK and in India are both um, proud signatories. Um, but um, I, I think uh, even, even before the crisis, I think I think we we knew that the, we we knew that you know obviously the world would need to the world would need to do more. We were going to be pressing for um, greater action from all countries on, on reducing emissions, building resilience, and we were going to be calling on donors to support developing countries 
particularly the most vulnerable on, onto this sustainable recovery path, including through uh, kind of ambitious post-2020 climate finance um, commitments. Um, but at the same time, I think we want this to be a COP in which we also work to address practical challenges. And we're going to be focusing efforts on five priority areas where working with global partners, we think we can progress that. So that's adaptation and resilience, nature, energy transition, um, clean transport and um, finance. Um, I've already spoken a bit about how we're working with India in some of those areas, but we're really keen to ramp up that collaboration in advance of, um, of COP. And um, one of the things we, we're keen to do is obviously champion and promote those Indian led initiatives. So the Interna International Solar Alliance, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, and for the world to kind of hear about all the all of these incredible things which the um, the Indian government is doing. Let me ask you this candidly, because while there is importance for strong federalism and strong leaders domestically, the sense or the fear also seems to be that when these leaders come to the table to talk about the environment, they will bring with it the same air of trade protectionism, of the kind of boundaries we've seen building both physically and virtually through this year. Do you think that's going to affect conversations or do you think people or leaders have realized that the overarching context and importance needs to be climate change? Look, I, I think the United States has some repair work to do here. We were the ones that brought the international community along, along with our European uh, partners, and, and as I said, with India, and then, we, and then we walked away. So actually, I think we have some, some trust uh, rebuilding to do and demonstration that we're really in this. Now, one of the it, great things about the Paris Agreement is that we didn't come up with two different systems, one for the developed world, one for the developing world. And so this notion of bifurcation uh, went away. But every country did come up with their own pathway, which I think is the, the right formula going forward, because India's needs and the US needs and the UK needs and South Africa's are, are all different. You know, what our, our impacts on our populations are different as we move to this green economy. So no question, every country is going to come with their own set of passions, their issues, their priorities. That is exactly the way an international negotiation is supposed to work. But I think by now we all see the imperative as well and we see the urgency. And so I'm, I'm actually really hopeful that when we get these leaders back around the table, and again, I'm hoping that the U.S. can play a leadership role here uh, sometime soon, that we can have some really, really important outcomes. Mm -hmm. Natalie, well, some of the stumbling blocks for, for India are well known, whether it's access to finance or the fact that perhaps regulatory policy needs to be more consistent. Any thoughts on whether we need to build on intellectual capacity and what kind of bilateral cooperation do you think could emerge from there between India and the U.K.? Um, I think I think there's already a, a huge amount of uh, a really strong intellectual capital um, in India. Excellent researchers, excellent scientists. Um, but of course, climate change is a global phenomenon that that isn't limited by political boundaries. So, um, building that global intellectual capital is really important, and it's important for universities and researchers to work together across boundaries. I mean, again, our two governments are already doing a lot of that. Um, we have a joint um, Newton Baba partnership where we match resources to fund research and innovation projects across both countries. And um, for example, we have our Royal Academy of Engineering working with Indian universities, looking at how renewables can be brought further into the engineering curricula. We have a partnership between the Met Office and the Ministry of Earth Sciences, looking at how weather modeling can be translated so that it um, provides better kind of climate resilience and adaptation. We're looking at jointly at things like clean energy. Um, so that's, that's really important, but it's also really important to get the private sector involved in that too. Um, we recently launched a big innovation challenge fund fo focused on future mobility with the express aim of bringing together business industry um, coalitions. Um, but underlying all of this, I think a really important factor is finance. Um, uh, and clearly uh, in a COP26 context, public finance is extremely important. But I think private sector finance is also critical um, for, uh, to, to achieve the transformation that we need to achieve. Um, in, in, in renewable infrastructure in particular. And I think the great news is that institutional investors in London, around the world, 
hard-nosed people, they're all looking at these climate risks in the future and focusing their efforts on green investment and on greening the financial system so that we factor in um, climate risk. And that's an area which the UK and India are working, I think, particularly closely on. Our two private sectors are collaborating through a sustainable finance initiative. We've seen 150 crores worth of green bonds on the London Stock Exchange. Um, and I think I earlier mentioned our Green Growth Equity Fund, a joint initiative where both governments have put in seed capital, but have attracted private sector investment too. And I think that's, uh, that's really important, but it's obviously important that alongside all of these mobilization initiatives, um, we, we do also look at the way in which the financial system works, the way in which that reflects um, risk. And it was exciting to see the governor of the RBI um, talk about the risk of, of climate to the financial sector the other day. Um, and, and, we'll, and we'll be working closely with the RBI and the Ministry of Finance on, on these issues. Finally, if I may ask you both, uh, Natalie, you could go first. If, you know, I had to ask you to pick out three topics that you would want reiterated from now until November 2021, so that they're really top of mind within the Green Initiative context, what are the three things you would want to hear again and again from countries and communities? Actually, interesting, you said, you said three. Um, as uh, COP26, we actually have um, five um, campaigns. So if you will forgive me, I'll talk about the, fi I'll talk about the five campaigns. Um, the first one is, um, is clean energy transition. And it's all about um, responding to this incredible uh, uh, shift in the, in the cost of renewables and supporting that transition. Um, then, of course, there is finance. And it's about, as I said, mobilizing green finance and greening the financial system. Uh, then the clean transport, um, electric mobility, phasing out the internal combustion engine, and adaptation and resilience, also so important, and particularly in countries like India, you know, it's important that we all um, recognize and, uh, that. And then, and then finally, nature and biodiversity, which is uh, also so important uh, uh, to, to climate and to emissions, but also, as we've seen with the COVID crisis, it's just so important. Yeah, great. So he, my list of three, I don't have five. So uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie got me with an extra two, but it's a great, it's a great list. And it's a great question. I mean, first, I would just say, look, going going back to the bilateral relationship, I, I really do think this is an area where the US and India can actually lead the world. Uh, in our collaborations between governments, we can help drive really, really ambitious policy outcomes. And I think we're so well suited to work in this area. That's first. Uh, second, the private sector can be a huge part and must be a huge part of the solution. And I think that Indian policymakers and US policymakers need to send that signal strongly that uh, the private sector needs to stand up and do so in a responsible way. And I think they are really committed to this area, uh, to responsible investing. It's a huge opportunity for the private sector. And I guess my third point is, you know, this is what the younger generation of India, of the United States, of Europe, of the UK, this is what they want us to focus on. This is the issues that are around the table. When I hear my high school age kids and middle age, middle school age kids talk, they are talking about why we didn't do more to protect our planet. And I just think we, we really need to listen to the younger voices out there because they, they have it right. And uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic if we can get our governments together and, and listen to the will uh, of our people in this. Both sets of fantastic points. And indeed, I think if anything, we need to do this for the youth. COVID should have taught us that much. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you both so much for joining in and weighing in on this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.